Welcome to First. I'm Nichelle Polson along with Mark Eichmann and Shirley Men. They called it extraordinary. Delaware takes an extra day to come up with a budget. Some are predicting the same thing could happen next year. Dr. Yasser Payne and his People's Project are back on the streets of Wilmington looking for a connection between violence and public health. And we'll talk to Wilmington's mayor as well. The Queen is back open for business. Live Nation tries to prove that bigger is better and plans to bring bigger name shows to Wilmington. First, your public media news magazine starts now. On July 2nd, the Delaware Legislature did something they called extraordinary. A budget couldn't be passed by July 1st. It did get signed on the 3rd, but exactly how did this happen? It's our first look. Today we do have a constitutional obligation to pass a balanced budget, but it is our responsibility that we pass a budget that is reflective of our Delaware values. A tired-sounding Valerie Longhurst. Her house colleagues Friday night could not find the votes to pass a hike in the personal income tax. That set in motion events that hadn't happened in 40 years. After everyone went home at 5.30 Saturday morning, leaders in both parties worked to put together a new budget plan, one that Governor John Carney praised just after 1 a.m. Monday, July 3rd. I'm pleased to say that this solution is about half revenue uh, and half spending. It's really a good first step. The steps they took included a hike in the cigarette and alcohol taxes and a 1% hike in the real estate transfer tax. Republicans got concessions they wanted. If we're not going to get some modifications to prevailing wage and there would be no income tax, we were able to uh, put in place uh, three study committees to look at sort of a fiscal governor or a reserve fund mechanism, uh, the education, which we heard a lot, uh, and I know the governor heard a lot when he went around to, you know, should districts be consolidated, and if not, could something else be done to help lower those costs? The grant and aid money for nonprofits was restored, but what about the long term? Already there are predictions of a $50 million budget hole. Next year we'll Nine. likely be in the same situation where we're going to have to make, you know, more cuts just to get to a balanced budget. I might say, it's not like we're not used to it. Yeah. Right. One of the more amazing footnotes from Sunday night, the final session didn't start until almost 10 p.m. because it took the printing office two hours to get things ready. Let's dig a little deeper now in our State of Play segment. Steve Tanzer of DelawareLiberal.net is back to kind of dissect what happened over the past weekend, June 30th, July 1st, July 2nd, as it went on. Uh, so many layers here. Uh, initial reactions to kind of the way things all went down, it was, it was kind of a mess. I've either worked for or reported on the Delaware General Assembly for 35 years. I have never, ever seen a more pathetic negotiation to put together a budget in, in my time. I, I just, it's just incredible. It started in January when John Carney said, well, we're going to do a 50% cut, 50% revenue raise to come to a balanced budget. And then he immediately spent the next three months going out, having coffees with people to figure out what he should do. Not exactly prepared to serve from day one. Then you had awful negotiating tactics by Pete Schwarzkopf, the Speaker of the House. Nobody opposed the increase in the corporate tax rates. Uh, Secretary of State Jeff Bullock had been pushing for that for years. Nobody was really opposed to it, but the Republicans were like, well, you know, we'd really like to get rid of that estate tax, which means that the wealthiest hoarders of wealth in Delaware won't ever have to pay for that. And the Democrats said, well, sure. And that was the trade-off there. They got that. The chamber and the Republicans wanted the so-called public-private partnership, the, the basically cutting out the middleman to giving public funds to private companies. Um, it was, it's, by the way, not called the public-private partnership, but the uh, Delaware uh, uh, Prosperity Partnership. Um, and they passed it. Didn't hold that as a bargaining chip. They passed the changes to the Coastal Zone Act, which the Chamber of Commerce wanted. Didn't hold that as a bargaining chip. So it comes down to the end of session, and what you essentially have is a proposed increase in personal income tax rates, proposed increases in cigarette tax and um, uh, alcohol taxes. Right. They, 
put the income tax rate of bill up for vote in the House. All they need, all they need, are all the Democrats to vote for the bill. Andrea Bennett votes no, much to the shock of everybody. Now, have to understand about Andrea Bennett. She's actually, her, her maiden name was Andrea Viola. Her father is John Viola. Her father is also the House Majority Whip. His only job is to make sure that all the votes are there for legislation being brought to the floor and his own daughter kills the bill. So, and so that's when the wheels really fell off of, of kind of the deal that, they, that was in place. But, that wasn't even, but the point was the Democrats didn't even have it as a bargaining chip anymore. If you remember, the Republicans were like, well, uh, maybe we'll do it if you get rid of you know, uh, the prevailing wage. You know, right. We want people to work for less. They deserve the right to work for less money. These aren't even serious gubernatorial governors, you know, governing things. These are the things that they're holding out as their bargaining chips. Well, the Democrats lost that bargaining chip. They'd already lost the other two because they gave them away for nothing. So after things fell apart on Saturday, well early, after midnight, early Saturday yes, morning, yes, right? they came back Sunday and passed a Band-Aid budget. They simply did do the increases in the alcohol tax, the increases in the tobacco taxes, and also increased the realty transfer tax, which, of course, will make home sales that much more challenging. If you look at the cuts in the budget, we're talking $30 million in cuts for education alone. I went through the budget. You know what wasn't cut on any line in that entire budget? Travel expenses for every single agency of the state. They all say the exact same as they were last year. And even worse, they allowed unused travel expenses to roll over. over. I mean, just awful. I, I've never seen such ineptitude. The winners in this session were the Chamber of Commerce. Without a doubt, they got everything they wanted, and uh, they forestalled any tax increases on Delaware's wealthiest citizens. So is this set, it's unseen, you said in 35 years that you've been down there and following along. Uh, does this set the precedent then for, for next time around that it will be easier to, to delay and, and get to a, an impasse again, that, that now we've set a new precedent that, yeah, hey, we can do this too, just like other states have? Yeah, I mean, what you're seeing is Delaware becoming like other states. And, and in my opinion, it's because of Republicans basically saying there's going to be a price to pay for everything. We're not really serious about governing. So you're just going to have to agree to these things. Otherwise, we will be intransigent and we will have a crisis. Um, but and Republicans are saying, declaring a victory in, in this thing because they've avoided the personal income tax they've increases. They've avoided the so personal income tax increases on Delaware's wealthiest citizens. Yes, that is what they call a victory. And from that standpoint, it is a victory. Okay, so beyond, uh, beyond some budget things, uh, another item that mm -hmm. got sort of pushed off the, the cannabis task force we're going to have now to look at the uh, General Assembly loves to create task force. Uh, yeah. you, see, you see that moving forward in the next year? <laughs> yes, they'll have a task force. They'll come up with something and it won't pass. I mean, uh, cannabis legalization in Delaware is never going to pass as long as the police in Delaware have such power. Through, through, among other things, many former police, not just state police, but also local and municipal police serving in the Delaware General Assembly. And um, the, you know, Pete Schwartz coughs the Speaker of the House. I mean, you know, former state trooper, former commander. Lots of things. January will be here before you know it, I'm sure. Steve Tanzer following it all at <laughs> DelawareLiberal.net. Steve, thanks so much. My pleasure. <laughs> Coming up on First, some big names are expecting big things to happen at the Queen Theater now that Live Nation is running the show. And later, First goes to Arden to experience photographs that are more than just taking pictures. Five years ago, University of Delaware's professor, Dr. Yasser Payne, researched the causes of physical violence in the city's east side and south bridge neighborhoods. Now he's back with another team to study the correlation between violence and health in the city's west side and north side neighborhoods. Both projects are considered participatory action research, which uses people from the community to gather data. There are people that are really going through a lot in this city. 71,000 people in the city of Wilmington, and many are separated by race and economics. And in some communities, people are in poor health and exposed to violence. Are the two related? It's believed that in experiencing violence, there could be a number of physical health-related injuries or issues as a result of life in the streets. So if you can't afford 
um, access to healthy food as you can afford transportation to get where you need to go. You know, some people do what they feel that they need to do to get those things. And that leads to street life in different forms. Which is why Brooklyn Hitchens, Dr. Yasser Payne, and a team of others are taking a look at violence from a public health perspective. We need good data. We need to know how people are actually living. We need to know how they are experiencing health, opportunity, and violence, but in real time. What we're doing today, we're doing a survey on the health, opportunities, and violence. Inside the William Hicks Anderson Community Center, these men and women are taking a 45-page survey. They're just a small population that's being interviewed on the west side about their personal experiences. Riverside residents have been surveyed as well. They all have one thing in common, and that's living in low-income communities. Because most people inside these neighborhoods are not violent, right? Most people are just poor. Well, people inside Riverside Projects are not violent people. Most people in the streets aren't violent as a form of identity, right? But you do have that small critical mass, one to five percent, as we say as social scientists, within the streets or an overall city that contributes to the vast majority of the violence. Thanks to the Department of Medicine at Christiana Care Hospital, the University of Delaware, and other partnering agencies, the project known as Street Participatory Action Research is back up and running again to collect this data. Although health is the focus this time around, for Contel Copeland, it hits too close to home. Um, before I started working here, I worked at Christiana Hospital for three years, and I've came across so many black men that were 50, 45, you know, up in age, and that was their first time being in a hospital seeing a doctor. Copeland, formerly engaged in the streets, worked to become a part of this team as a way to give back to his community. A simple ride with his children put him on the right track. We was just riding one day, listening to music, and they was in the back seat, and I'm looking through my rear view, and they don't really know I'm looking at them, and I'm looking at their faces and how it's unexplainable, like they were just happy. And that moment just got me, man. Like that moment I was like, I can't leave this. Like I can never leave them again. As for the project, residents also had their blood pressure taken. Once research is completed, the data will be analyzed and released into a report that may fully explain the different behaviors in the city. Violence isn't rampant in Wilmington, right? It isn't like you're gonna walk outside and it is a wild, wild west scenario. Right? So it's contained usually in small neighborhoods um, 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 and, and, and generally among street identified population and really a cut of that population. And my thing is let's go in and tell their story. The PAR team's mission isn't over just yet. They're still collecting data and have stops planned for the Youth Empowerment Center on Sycamore Street and then back to the William Hicks Anderson Center. While Dr. Yasser Payne, Christiana Care Hospital and the University of Delaware work together to study violence from a health perspective, let's shift gears at this time and talk with Wilmington Mayor Mike Prezicki about his plans for the city of Wilmington. He's our first person this week. Welcome, Mayor. Thanks to be here. So roughly six months in office, still lots to tackle, such as the city's gun violence. What's your reaction and plans going forward? Well, I think, um, I mean, for a lot of people, six months retrospective is important. For me, it's just been day after day, just trying to make progress. And I feel real good about what we're doing. Uh, I think we understand the nature of our problems. I think poverty is, um, is at the root of, of what we have to deal with in our city. And it's funny, I look at, uh, I look at cities uh, that had, have had great progress over the year, most notably New York City, which is very, very different than ours, but it has neighborhoods that are similar. And in their worst neighborhoods, they have much, much lower crime rates. And if you take a look at those neighborhoods, you see that, that the jobless rate is much lower than ours, that people are feeling a part of the system. You've got people who are engaged in, in the American franchise. And to me, that's, that's the major effort that we've got to uh, undertake because we've got to get people working. We've got to get people just in a normal flow of life and not sitting around on corners thinking about what kind of mischief to get into. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, but a six-year-old shot by a stray bullet uh, was among the number of 100 victims or so. Um, there was an arrest. The first suspect was let go, then there was another, but that was kind of qu kept quiet. Can you explain that? I, I cannot begin to explain it. The best, in, the best uh, information I have is that the Attorney General's office uh, 
had responsibility for that case and it was their policy not to reduce, release information. Now we did because obviously the public was very interested in this case and so we did. We were accused of, of jumping the gun and just trying to make a big deal out of it. Look, we, uh, we had information, we did the best we could with the information we had as soon as we realized that the individual we had in custody uh, uh, was not the individual we were looking for, we, we released him. And that's the best we could do. Uh, we're not, this is not about headlines, good Lord. <clears throat> you know, all we wanna do is get some of these guys off the street. You know, what we find out, and this is, this is information I'm collecting today, but we are finding out that the people who are in the system are, are seriously repeat offenders. And they're people with backgrounds that don't suggest, but predict that they're gonna be either shooters or getting shot themselves. We have people who've been shot three times in a couple of years. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. this is a dysfunctional part of our community that we've got to deal with. And so I think, you know, look, we hired a, a great police chief. I think he's doing an outstanding job. He's as dedicated as you can imagine. He's putting, he's putting uh, strategies in place that we believe are gonna work. And so we've got to be patient. Yeah, actually, we had the opportunity to travel with the chief, chief, the new chief, Chief Robert Tracy, and he took us on the West Center City section. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> he said a goal of his was to go to community meetings. Uh, I've, I was actually, I actually attended the Hedgeville meeting where you uh, mm -hmm. attended as well. Have you learned anything new from the residents? I think. No, I don't think we've learned anything new. I think that the, and I don't think we're trying to, I think what we're trying to do is create trust so that the residents feel good about picking up the phone and calling us. To me, that's, the, that's what we've got to do. I, look, I've got to build up trust as mayor in communities that aren't used to seeing a mayor and haven't seen me enough, and the chief's got to do the same. And I believe that's going to happen, and when it happens, you're going to see the, the interchange of information, which is what we need to uh, reduce crime. It's interesting that you talk, that, that you mentioned trust, um, because at the Hedgeville meeting, it seemed to be a few community members who wanted a quick fix. How do you explain a quick fix when it comes to violence? Is there one? <clears throat> no, there is no, you know, vi violence is what results when the normal, normal social flows don't exist anymore, when you don't have the normal cadence of going to work in the morning, coming home tired, going to bed and starting the process all over again. Uh, it's uh, the result of broken families and schools that don't work and kids not interested in school. It's just a much, much more profound set of circumstances we have to deal with. And so anybody who tells you, I remember Michael Nutter from Philadelphia said, anybody who tells you there's an answer, a, a simple answer to this, he said, stay away from them because they're dangerous. Mm -hmm. And I think he's right. Okay, well outside of gun violence, let's talk about some of the new construction right at the corner of North and Orange Street. Sure. There's a new Caribbean restaurant, there's apartment complex being built right across from that. Uh, how do you plan to feel, feel well, like I think that, all so, these apartments? Yeah, so I'll anticipate your, wealth. First of all, what's remarkable is that of all the apartments that are on Market Street today, m largely Buccini Poland's project, I think he's got one vacant unit. Mm -hmm. And they've, they've pre-rented that unit you've spoken about uh, that you referred to over in Orange Street. They've got 100 units already pre-rented. So wow. we have a tremendous demand here that people simply don't understand. We have outsiders don't understand. We understand the appeal of the city. I think there's a national trend of moving back in the cities. Uh, and we're enjoying, uh, we're enjoying that same uh, experience here. Louis Capano is building uh, 160, 170 units right on the riverfront, right up from Market Street. He's, uh, he's uh, intends to build several hundred units over on Lee Boulevard, Miller Road area. Uh, then of course, we've got a large apartment project going up on Pennsylvania Avenue. I yeah, think it's about I've 170 units that. as well. I mean, so mm -hmm. we've, got, we've got so many good things going on. Then the riverfront, we've got two hotels that, uh, that are being planned to start over the next 90 to 120 days. We've got the bridge we're putting up. Uh, we're doing a, uh, a large a development strategy, strategic plan for, uh, for South Market Street. There's an awful lot that's very positive. And our view of the world is we're just gonna, we're just gonna keep watching the positive things and not be taken down by the negative stuff until we get that under control. Okay, if there's one thing you want our audience to take home from this interview, what is that? I think I just said it. I think people have to understand that 
There are so many good things going on. We have been held hostage by this crime issue for five years now. I mean, all we focus on is that. And we forget about all the good things. There are so many very positive things going on. You know, employment is up. We don't have people leaving the way they were talking about for years. All of a sudden, there's a new sense of optimism, and I really believe that uh, I think we're in the right direction. Okay. Wilmington Mayor Mike Przicki, thanks so much for being here. Uh, for those of you at home, you can watch this interview in its entirety by going online to newsworks.org slash Delaware. We now know who's taking over operations at the historic Queen Theater in downtown Wilmington. Live Nation, the largest live entertainment company in the world, is setting up shop and changes are on the way. The Queen has shed all of its World Cafe Live markings as it begins a new chapter under Live Nation's banner. Live Nation is a juggernaut when it comes to things like music concerts and comedy shows. I'd like to take a moment to, uh, to quote the great philosopher and songwriter Ruth Pointer, who said, I'm so excited. I just can't hide it. I'm about to lose control and I think I like it. Michael Grozier is the executive vice president of clubs and theaters for Live Nation. Grozier says seeing all of the cranes and construction downtown got him thinking that now's the time to expand Live Nation's reach into Wilmington. The fact that they built 2,000 apartments downtown and, and, uh, and they plan to build 2,000 more, I think just creating a more vibrant downtown is very attractive to us. The Bacini Poland Group is behind all of that residential construction. There's this global trend towards urbanization. Millennials want to be in cities. People want to be in cities. Um, I think Wilmington has so much wind at our back right now. We are determined to get 5,000 people living downtown in this city in the next four years, and we're on track to make that happen. The Wilmington developer has also been one of the biggest cheerleaders for the city's revival. Chris Piccini is convinced Live Nation will give Wilmington that nudge to take it to the next level by bringing in bigger name shows and appealing to younger audiences. They really know this market and uh, they're 100% convinced that we can get more um, events here and bigger events here as well. Live Nation signed a 10-year lease with BPG. They bought the Queen 10 years ago. At the time, Puccini hoped resurrecting the Queen would be the catalyst to Wilmington's revitalization with World Cafe Live as a partner. Well, hello, Wilmington, Delaware. And it was for six years. In that time, Market Street changed a lot, but it wasn't enough for founder Hal Real, who announced World Cafe Live's exit from the Queen earlier this year. When the opportunity came to, to, to build on what Hal had started, we thought it was a great opportunity for Live Nation. We thought it was the right time to, for us to come to Wilmington. Uh, there's just so much enthusiasm and passion and love for the city, and I think the combined city energy around let's build this together was really intoxicating for us. As for the Light Up the Queen Foundation, it has the full support of Live Nation, with Tina Betts at the helm. We're big community participants, and, and, and if we can help get another instrument in another kid's hand and make another uh, musician for tomorrow, we're all about it. I think the exciting thing is to think about where we're going to be literally a year from now, three years, five years, ten years. And renovations are underway at the Queen. In addition to some cosmetic changes, a wraparound patio is being built at the front of the building. Also, a yet to be named restaurant partner to serve food is also in the works. Grozier hopes to create 130 full and part time jobs. Now let's head to Arden for first experience. For Alida Fish, photography is more than just taking pictures. It's a doorway into another world, one she creates and controls from her Arden studio. Let's go behind the scenes to see these worlds come to life. I'm Alida Fish, I'm a photographer. My sister's a painter, my mother was a sculptor, my grandfather was a painter, and I think the general consensus was that I wasn't going to be one of them. So they gave me a camera. I went to college and, you know, I thought I would get involved with finance and something totally different. And I took a vacation. I went to North Carolina to this school, Penland School of Crafts, and took a workshop in photography. 
And I ended up coming back and staying there for two years. I got a good education in photography. And when I left there, I went to graduate school in photography. I fall right into the fine art area now, and I think I really wanted to be something different, but it was never satisfying. I tried a number of different things, and I just kept coming back to art. And so when I went to Penland and had this long sort of immersion in uh, photography, that was it. I never went back. I'd create these little worlds, and I always have, ever since, you know, playing like as a child, making up these, these sort of environments that, uh, out of old tree roots and things. If I photograph a plant, a frog, or, you know, anything, I think of them sort of as portraits, and they're very alive to me. I love it when I'm outdoors and I see something, I'm always looking at plants, and I see something that I think is really beautiful, it just catches my eye, and that I think can be transformed through photography. I take a big sheet of aluminum, I abrade it, sand it, put it down in a tub, and put a piece of rusty steel on top of it that has a shape that I like and that I think will look good with this image that I've just photographed. I transfer the image, the ink, onto the aluminum. And then when I finally got a print, when I've just laid the image down on the metal and it all sinks, because I may only get one of these out of like 12, and I get the good one, it's like, oh yeah. So those are my two big moments. I love to spend time by myself. I don't even listen to music in here. I'm, I, it's quiet in here most of the time, except when the dog is here, you know, playing. <laughs> a lot of older artists stop working, and I actually contemplated that possibility. I thought, well, this might be it. I might never have another idea worth pursuing, you know, that somebody else could do it. And as it turns out, I am still going. My mother had stayed in the studio that we have on the property here. She lived there for 10 years. And right up to the bitter end, she was modeling clay and making little sketches. There must have been thousands of them. So, you know, maybe I've inherited a little bit of that. Part of what makes my life worth living is doing this work. It keeps me sane, <laughs> I will say that. I'm not about to stop. Aleta's work has been exhibited all over the United States, including at the Delaware Art Museum. She's also Professor Emerita at the University of the Arts, Philadelphia. You can see more of her work online at aladafish.com. Next week on First, we take one more review of the just-concluded legislative session with Delaware Governor John Carney. And we'll profile two musicians who love to play the Ladybug Festival coming up next weekend. That story comes to us courtesy of our friends at Friday Arts. They are Jersey girls who love Wilmington. That is First for this week. We thank you for watching. For Mark Eichmann, Shirley Men, I'm Nichelle Poston. Have a great week.